OK, tech test. This will work fine, don't worry. If I do, 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 present on here, you're going to have to tell me if you can see it. Ah. Share that screen content from camera. OK, I think it's going to work. What do you see? Whiteboard. Nice. OK, and now the next test. You see me drawing? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Works perfectly. OK, I made this in the olden days and it's still all my best advice, um, so I've not changed it. This is before I'd ever heard of Miro. We used to do things in person and I thought I don't want slides. Mostly I just want to be able to write on a whiteboard, but I couldn't write fast enough. So this was my workaround. So OKRs, objects, objectives and key results. Um, this is what I wish we'd known when we started. I put this together um, after working at the BBC uh, on the children's website, CBBs and CBBC. If you've got young kids in the UK, you definitely know them. It was really fun things to work on. Um, and we tried using OKRs over about an 18 month period. Um, there's a lot, it sounds so simple, there's a lot of work to try and get it right. Uh, so if somebody had talked me through all this stuff that I'd learned by the end of 18 months at the start, I think it would have helped. So that's my gift to you. Um, it's a few years old, but it's still all the same advice I keep coming back to, so I'm glad I wrote it all down. Um, in the team, it was fairly big, 20 something people uh, in quite a big department and the BBC is huge. There's a, it sometimes feels you're on a team of 3000 if you add up all the different teams that work on different parts of the website. But they didn't have a sort of central mandate that everyone use OKRs and here's the ones at the top and they cascade down. I think you really don't need it. What happened was um, one team, I think BBC Sport was the first area, uh, bought this book from Christina Woodkey. They found it useful. Let's replay on that. Uh, so this was getting passed around. There was copies everywhere. It is. It's really short, uh, useful. It's got drawings in it and stuff. And it's one of those business stories uh, that makes it really digestible. So it's good. I recommend it. And that quote there, that that really tempted and caught my attention because there's so many good ideas. You're always getting diverted on to the next one. Um, the golden apple there comes from a story that they tell at the start of the book. It's an ancient Greek myth where Atalanta uh, was a woman who was a fabulous hunter and warrior and all sorts, but wasn't allowed to just say, no, I'm not getting married. So when suitors came along, she said, OK, if you can beat me in a foot race, I'll marry you and be miserable. Otherwise, I don't have to. Um, she beat everyone, was delighted until one wily fellow got three golden apples and got somebody to roll them across the path as she was running. And as you're running there, you think, I really want to win this race. But look, that's well carved and valuable. You stop and get it. Nobody's saying a golden apple is not valuable, but by taking her eye off the ball all those times, she had to get married and wasn't happy. Um, Ancient Greece was a different time, strange story in some ways, but there's some lesson there for us all. We're not saying these are bad ideas. These are very tempting things that our teams get diverted onto. So if you've picked what's important, how do you keep focused on that? The idea is OKRs. So to get started, you draw a big four square board, says the book, up next to wherever your Kanban or Scrum board is, so it's visible to the team. And what you've got is um, your key results. So your objective is something inspirational, something you can remember, something in a sentence, uh, and your key results are measurable. We know we're going in the right direction when we do these things, and we're hoping if it's one of those big reaching, what's the most we can do OKRs, if we get anywhere near it by a date we choose, we're delighted. Um, up in the top left is your weekly priorities. So every week, if we want to move towards those key results, if we want to do that, there's probably a hundred other things you have to do. But what is the top things, the do not drop items you want to get done this week? So you write them, you share them as a team, you check in every Monday to see if you got last week's done, the new numbers for the key results, and that confidence we use a scale of one to ten. Do you think we're going to meet it by the end of the quarter, that date we've set? And the two down the bottom are in the next four weeks, what's coming up so you don't get surprised every Monday and sort of team health as you're radically focusing on this one thing you want. Um, what do you worry might all go to hell? So that can be the literal like health of your team. If everyone's trying to reach this amazing goal and you're working as hard as you can, is everyone just working till midnight and skipping lunch breaks? Because that's not good. Are you all getting short and snappy with each other and miserable? 
uh, but it can be wider than that. So it can be the health of your product. Um, things like uh, as we're adding this new feature or focusing on driving user retention or whatever you pick is are we ignoring bug reports? Are we ignoring other things that need some love and attention? What's what's going on with everything else? And um, we weren't sure for any of this what the right things to do are. We had lots of questions like we use Kanban anyway. How does this Monday check in and sort of the Friday wins where you go and see how far you've done and celebrate it? How does that fit in? Does that replace other things? And what should we pick for our like objectives? And the numbers especially confused us. The best decision we made was don't worry about it too much. We'll have a best guess. We reckoned it was quite important uh, to get users to try more different content types because we've seen evidence that if people come and just play one game or see one video or just one type of thing, they just get that and move away. Uh, if they realise more about the breadth of what's on the site, they get a lot more out of it. They come back again and again. So we'd like people to see more, both more things in a single visit and more types of stuff. We didn't know what a good number was. We thought up 50%. Why not? We'll see what happens and we won't kick ourselves too bad if that's not what happens later. Um, we had a lot more questions than that, like what was the right things to measure for health? And uh, are we all sure we know what 9 out of 10 confidence means? But we decided just get cracking. This was on um, Pancake Day, I think. So midway through the first calendar year's quarter, it was only about six weeks to go. Uh, but I think Pancake Day gave us a nice metaphor, like the first one's always going to be rubbish. Don't think about it too much. Uh, best decision we made, because some of the things that came up that confused us, that hurt, um, we wouldn't have thought of. So even if we'd spent weeks and weeks longer planning about the things we thought we were worried about, there's loads we'd have missed. So. Crack on and have a go. And the second best decision we made was putting in a regular retro at the end of the quarters, a good big session where you finish this, we would all get together in a room and up in the walls, we'd put a replica of that four square board six weeks in and we all got the whole team together, everyone involved to put up uh, yellow explanations. What's any of this for? Because there's always some new framework or some new thing you're doing. It's easy to hear about it once and then forget. So. Why do we put weekly priorities up? Do we actually mean you're going to do that and nothing else this week? What did we say about team health? That kind of explanation was just a good chance to check in and realise miscommunications. I'd recommend that with anything. We had blue things that we thought were working well for us that we hadn't had before. Better visibility or better focus or some comments that came up there. And red things were like this. This is just not working for us. I mean, we should change this. It's not happening. It was really useful to have a discussion about what did or didn't work on that topic. But we didn't just do that. We replicated lots of things about our, our work on the walls in this session. So I'd mentioned before we're already doing Kanban. So we've got some meetings. What are they all for? We've got retros. Are they meant to be OKRs now? We've got stand ups. Is that different from Monday plannings? How does it all fit together? So again, that yellow check in on the OKR stuff was good, but it's also helpful. Like when people misunderstand the point of stand ups, I think I'm giving a, an update to the delivery manager rather than self organising as a team. Lots of good things came out outside of the OKR process. And again, some good chances to talk about what's working for us and what we like. I think with Monday planning, um, it was good to hear more about the why why we're putting things together, why a particular ticket's going on the board and outside the, the sort of dev team work as well. What is the product manager trying to achieve this week? Or when our uh, tech lead is off in loads of meetings with architecture and other parts of the thing, what's that trying to achieve by the end of the week? We felt we had more visibility on the team, but a couple of things we really weren't sure about. Um, Monday morning, it suggests in the book, as you come in and you say, um, given everything we know about what we want to achieve this quarter, what is the most important thing to do this week? Most people on a Monday morning can barely remember their password. Like, I don't know, give me a minute. Um, we decided like over a few iterations of this with the same uh, every quarter, we had this similar thing looking at what was working or not. We tried a few different things and we decided Monday mornings to split into the sort of small the smaller squads maybe the two or three people who are focusing on different areas together to have a chat in a small group about what was our plan sketch it out however you like some people had a bit of a plan for the quarter others were uh, uh, just breaking down development work as they went along then get together and play that back to the whole team it's much better than putting people on the spot and asking what they think friday wins was another one that we liked the idea of um but it just was not working for us. One thing was, as described in the book, it was so American, like you get together maybe with beers and cake. We don't often have beers in our offices. 
um, and talk about like what you're thankful for, what you've really appreciated this team. It just felt a bit awkward. And the other thing was, if the Friday is the chance where you at the end of the week say, how much did we achieve? If you've forgotten about something, there's quite often something you had said was important this week and you could have done if you'd remembered. And you've forgotten that was top number one as you got distracted working on something else. So we moved it to Thursday afternoons and we made it a super lightweight. Uh, what's what's the web team been up to where we shared a, a Google Slides link just a few hours before we got together uh, and just everyone was to put in what you're working on this week and how do you feel about it? Some of the gifts they are really expressed what was going on with folk as somebody was trying to use some painful library and um, had a gif of himself banging his head off a brick wall all week. And as uh, GDPR was coming in, that the BBC takes this seriously. The deadline was coming. The ICO hadn't quite decided um, what all the rules were about it for us to meet that deadline. There was a good uh, animated thing, you know, the gravity well of a black hole with a little dot saying our product manager's time <laughs> was stuck on that. There was a lot more understanding of what everyone's up to as they disappear off to meetings or sit there muttering at computers. The other thing I loved about it being a Friday afternoon, a Thursday afternoon, was if you remember something you've not done yet, you've got all of Friday to save the week. It's a good way to do things. Um, continuing on this sort of retrospective and, and looking back regularly, we brought in data. Some of the things we tried to do about uh, improving our usage stats were laughable. I mentioned getting 50% increase uh, in the number of sort of items and types of content all our users got. It's a really, really busy set of websites we're looking after and 50% up. That's like a million extra mouse clicks per week. That is a stunning achievement. And we only had six weeks to think about some experiments to try, uh, design them, build them and put them live. No, but that was just good in itself realizing how out of touch we were with what's feasible to try and move in a certain amount of time just gets you in a good habit of we should know more about this how can we um and set us on a good path we had uh, in those weekly updates we had a little like data stats corner with lots of really interesting insights that people on the team had found out like looking at um games or interactive things the the common advice on mobile is to go for landscape because people like to spread their thumbs across it. But for our users, almost everyone uses a portrait because they've only got little hands. <laughs> they've got short small thumbs. It's just useful to know about. Um, other things for the data, it was really useful to uh, talk about what we measured with team health. Some things, um, team health as a big survey felt really useful one or two times. You know, the Spotify team health check some sort of thing. But you start to get like um, question fatigue if you ask the same ones too often. So we're using this as a check in on how to change that. At one point we settled on a one emoji uh, survey, which was enough for us um, for then. And it was just good to see everyone at, the, everyone at once on a team. We hadn't talked about it, but something looked miserable one Monday. Give us a chance to talk about what's going on there. The other thing we struggled with, and everyone struggles, is BAU on any website of any size, and especially something like the BBC where there's loads of dependencies and other teams saying, we've changed this, can you update it? Apart from the new and shiny and important, when do we get time for all that BAU stuff is a constant question that people just have to tinker with. What are we trying to do here? It's kind of a bit fuzzy. Um, at one point, we had most of the board with OKR stuff, stuff towards our radically focused objectives. And down the bottom was a, a whip limit of one for other things. If it's BAU, you can bring one ticket on to work for that. And once that one's finished, we'll bring on the next. That's nice in theory, but for some of the work we're taking on, um, it was huge and complicated. And this made it really hard to realise the scope of what we're doing. One ongoing thing over uh, one quarter rumbling on in the background was us trying to shift to HTTPS. It sounds easy, right? It's just one more letter. There's a lot going on. The videos don't work. You can't connect to this service. You try and change this and it doesn't. And just doing it one ticket and like one person or a pair at a time picking it up stopped us being able to have a look at the whole thing and realising just what we're trying to take on. We changed that for one quarter to have uh, a sort of tech debt uh, objective, something about leaving the past behind us and showing the rest of the organisation how to get things um, uh, off your back, which worked fantastically. It's like turning a searchlight onto something. All that stuff that you have to ask other teams to do and they're too busy for, you can choose to spend your like political capital. They're, it's now. I know it's a pain, but we're getting this done by this quarter. So come on, do me a favour and I'll leave you alone later. 
There was things that have been hanging about for literally years. We're moving out of old data things. We're being sure or clear that we're not tripping ourselves up by depending on any legacy stuff that might go pop at some point. It felt wonderful. It did lead us down a bit of a bad path, as it's always tempting to say, we'll have one more OKR every quarter and just bucket in all the stuff we were going to do in that area. It can lead you towards what's all the work you were going to do anyway, and just OKRs are a fancy way to... Uh, list that. That is absolutely missing the point and just adding a lot of bump and overheads and ceremony around work you're going to do. You've been doing it for years. You know how to organise your work. Use this for the few things that you really want to move the needle on um, and let the rest of the work take care of itself in some other system. What else did we say? Oh yeah, after all this, what changed? One thing it worked fabulously for was that cycle of um, publish and reflect. Is this working for us or not? And having a, a firm structure every quarter around what did we say we, we, we tweak here? What did we hope to get out of it? And what did we learn? It was super useful. That thing about data really got us in great habits of um, we had it in our acceptance criteria when you're when you're making a ticket, like what are you hoping this will achieve? And when will you measure it? So after done, we had a column of uh, measure and learn and things would be there until a certain date. And it was always a fab stand up when something reached the right date and we get to hear. So how many people did click this or how much uh, of an effect did it have? Is it what we wanted? That on everything we put live, did it matter? Is just not a habit I've seen a lot of teams get into, even though a lot talk about it. That was good because we knew we wanted some sensible numbers at the end. Uh, so we wanted to see them change as we went. And it's just fabulous. It really makes you realise how hard it is to measure some things you want and how little idea you have um, of what's going on with a lot of the things you end up building. And um, another thing it really helped with um, was talking to each other openly about what are our chances of, of meeting this deadline became a more comfortable conversation. It's really interesting when you're saying we want to meet this by the end of the quarter. We know it might not be possible, but anywhere we can get near it is good. Do you think we will? On that scale of one to ten, you'd expect that to be widely distributed at the start of the quarter and narrow in with a few days to go. Everyone should know we're either making it or not. And some of the work we did, it was still wide open. And that made us realise that when you're asking the whole team, what do you think? Some people just aren't involved or have an understanding of what's going on with some bits of work. And they just look over and say, well, he looked confident. I assume it's going to be all right. I'll put an eight. Um, so we had to talk about, do we want to ask the whole team? Do we want to know more about what's going on? Or is there a few key things that just opened up those questions? Other things were, um, of the things we say are the most important thing to get done this week, what's the stats on how often we actually get them all done? It was less than 30% of the time. And that's a good time to reflect. Is this us stretching ourselves and saying if it was a fabulous week, we would? Or do we want to say it's this, it's this, anything more is a bonus, but absolutely we're doing these. It's the kind of thing that you can say what you're doing at the start and by the end of the year, you've drifted in different directions. So that every quarter coming back to it was good. The last thing it was superb for was there's always some stakeholder who wants to chat about some idea, wants to know when's the next time you could work on this or um, the product manager who wheels over and <laughs> drops people about the really latest great idea they've had. This gave us a really structured way to say, um, if there's something super urgent that needs doing, is it more urgent than this? Because this is what our focus is. And if you want us to derail that for your new thing, if it is that important, let's talk about that. Loads of people said, no, when should I talk to you? It's here when we're talking about the next quarter and it's here when we're having ideas about a quarter after that. If you want to come to either of those, if you give people a slot, then you're not forever fielding requests and, and getting interrupted by stuff. And I started to wonder, after doing it for a while, how else could you do OKRs? Everything I got here was out of one book, but both in prep for putting this talk together and for helping my team, I read about um, how else could you do OKRs? And it was surprising because Christina Wodke's advice is really good. Her book and website's got loads of good stuff, but that's one way to do it. Lots of other people don't use that four square thing at all. There's always describe what you're doing and have a few key measures of doing it. But apart from that, companies have really different approaches. If you look into OKRs at all, the place they got really famous, everybody likes doing what Google does. Um, and I'd come across a few times over a year, uh, this link on how Google does OKRs, but I didn't like its bait and switch. At the top, it says a two minute read. Um, and as you scroll down the page, uh, 
it's an 80 minute video. So <laughs> they try and they try and just trick you. Um, for you to learn from this, uh, I watched the whole thing to hear about what they do. And there is actually quite a nice digested summary on a mini site they've made. Some things are really good and interesting there. I like the idea that they separate between um, those knock it out of the park, the moonshot, the uh, if you get 70% of it, you're, you're doing well. And if you get more than that regularly, you're probably not ambitious enough. That's one way to use them. And that is how some teams at Google do their work. Like whatever you're doing is the most important thing we want to do for this company. If you need any help, give a shout and we can get a thousand extra people if, if, if that would help you. That's not the kind of work a lot of us do. It's like you've got this team of six. You've got this to be getting on with and you're pretty much on your own. <laughs> <laughs> and also that maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. It's fabulous for, for dreaming of indexing a billion web pages or maybe for your site, seeing how many more people you could get on it. Like if you really try, that's useful. But a different type of work is there's a huge marketing campaign or the Olympics is going live. I really need certainty. So you can use them both as long as you're really explicit about operational OKRs where this is what we're aiming for. This is what we expect to happen. And aspirational ones, the, the dreaming of big goals. What I didn't like about some of uh, OKR advice in Google is stuff that I would disagree with and go about different ways. And I quite like that since then, the person in the video has given an update of how he'd change things now. And he's basically taken all my advice. So maybe a confirmation bias. One thing they used to do at Google was your team would have an OKR and everyone on it would have their own OKRs. What that gives you is a radical focus in potentially 20 different directions. I don't see any need for that. Uh, so Google's now stopped that. Um, there's a team, you get a team pulling in the same direction with an OKR between them. And if there's anything about appraisals, like your personal goals, you're like, what should you be working on? You can talk about how have I supported my team meet their OKRs rather than everyone having a, a secret agenda or something else they're individually being judged on. Um, another thing that Google didn't have so much in some of the examples they've got here, they seemed very prosaic. A lot of the OKRs was internal stuff, milestones they'd meet or boxes they'd tick. They've moved over time more and more to customer focused things. What would the business outcome be of what you're doing? Why would the users care about what you're doing? Framing your key results in that way is something Christina Wodke talks about a lot and Google's moved towards a lot more. It gives your teams more of a reason uh, to be working on these things rather than we'll do these things because we said we would and opens up that that input, the creativity, the people closest to the work can say if that's what you want to do as a business, have you thought about doing it like this or could we try doing something different and gives more of that autonomy. On that, uh, and on my question of how does OKRs, do they fit in OK with Agile ways of working if we've not got it covered by uh, uh, all the things you do in your Kanban or Scrum, um, they fit in really nicely. So modern Agile is a lovely idea and there's lots of really good examples about how they uh, how they can fit in with OKRs to move you away from that feature factory, do what you're told mindset, uh, to let people talk about um, what value are we getting out of things and how can we experiment to, to rapidly do something more sensible on the topic. One more link I really liked. I saw a talk from Maria Scrivener, who'd worked at Redgate over some time, helping them get OKRs work well. She talks really, um, really, really passionately about this aspirational thing, about the way to do it. If you're aspirational in terms of maybe if you're trying to build a bridge and you can carry like eight bricks down to the river at once, if you set a goal of how can you carry 10 bricks down to the river, people are thinking maybe I can just strain or work twice as fast or cut my lunch break in half. And that's not really what you want. A different question, how could we get 100 bricks down to the river? Well, that's a different class of question. Now we're talking about a paved road. Could we get wheelbarrows? Could we get a truck? If you're asking teams to stretch themselves and come up with creative ideas to, to achieve more than, than any of you ever thought possible for the benefit of the company, you've got to be there to listen to those big ideas and changes and give them the support. Don't just say work hard or work it out how and, and hope people just um, work themselves into an early grave. If you want to achieve huge things as a company, um, give the teams a voice to ask for support and give them that support it's not fair. The other thing she talked a lot about was um, if you're going to do OKRs, make them the thing. There talk, there's talk sometimes of them being like New Year's resolutions. You know, you find them later like, how did we say that? <laughs> you don't know what's going on with them. Um, every stand up, every time you're talking about what's moved on the board, every everything on the board says it's either working towards one of your OKRs. What, why are we hoping? How will this do it? Or it's very clearly not. We're doing some stuff that isn't and either we're OK with that or we're frustrated and try to work on it. 
and for setting your objectives here, how do I pick an OKR? Get super clear what your team's there for. Why do you exist? If your team's here to keep X application running, that's not a reason. Like, let it die. Who cares? What's the X application for? Your team's to enable business value, user needs meeting, all that things. Get that described really, really well, and that gives you a reason to pick different OKRs rather than just some random stuff that happens every three months. Um, I've got two quotes that sum up the, the best and the worst I hope for from OKRs. And um, this is them used really, really well. So if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. I have seen it used really well to phrase as a business, as a as a product. We see these opportunities. We think if we did something in this area, it would move these these metrics. How might we do that, team? Do you think that's a feasible number to aim for? And, and what does it make you think about how we could do it? It's really good to explain the goal, explain we're going out to that endless sea. How do you think we should get there? Is making the best of the people in your teams, making it more satisfying and probably getting better ideas than you can come up with if you're a product manager or a senior exec locked in a room somewhere. And if that's their best, what's OK or is it their worst? I've used this quote in all kinds of situations. I think it sums up uh, Agile pretty well. Some people are like, Agile is the hot new thing, I have to use it. Um, tell me everything you're going to do. Uh, we'll put it in order and then tell me what sprint you're going to do it in and I'll hold it up. I said, that's just a Gantt chart. They say, no, it's sprint planning, Neil. <laughs> there's lots of overhead, there's lots of confusion about what words we're using or what we're trying to achieve with things. And at the end, all you've achieved is wasting your time. If you think from hearing about OKRs that it could make some material difference, you'd get something out of it that your team and your org isn't getting just now, go for it. Use them well. If you think we should use a lot of fancy words and pretty much the, the what you work on and what you'll do is the same with some uh, overhead, just bin it. What else would I like to tell you about? Everybody likes to talk about tools and there are people who will sell you all sorts of fancy things for looking after your OKRs and that's something you can get stuck on for a long time, especially try to look at what lots of teams are doing. Um, the way you use OKRs, like I talked about that rhythm of reflection will change lots and it should change lots. Uh, and you want that freedom so you don't know what tools you want and you don't want to spend your life configuring some tool or trying to bend, bend things to work with it. For me, that physical board uh, did most of our job and to track did we achieve all our priorities what was our confidence every week I took a photo every Monday it was a bit of work at the end of the quarter to like go and put it together but you could get all the graphs you want <laughs> other tools I used over time that I quite liked um, sharing a Google Sheet was quite good so that had uh, a little note about where we're up to on each key result and um, what's your confidence where do you think we'll get to by the end of the quarter I was shared that on Monday morning before we went in and at the end was our team health survey so for a long time that was just the one emoji survey and as we felt we needed it we did sort of a deeper dive into things um, and down there what's the web team been up to that uh, Google Google Slides is a fabulous tool because you if you've got the Google Slides open you can see all the different GIFs and all the images get, getting into it and you know uh, when it's ready to get up and show because we were working on uh, CBBs. You could theme it every month with a different favourite CBBs character. I just not had the same <laughs> the same joy at all other companies. You don't always get such a a good range of horrible histories or uh, the gojetters to choose from. And our last question, I think. How do you feel about deadlines? Like we all know we hate arbitrary deadlines, right? And these are the most arbitrary deadlines. We've decided three months feels like a good amount of time and we're going to just haul ourselves over the coals to try and do a good job by some date we've made up to get some number moved. Is that OK? I think it's super useful for framing the conversation. Um, it can make you not think about anything beyond that kind of three month horizon. It can make you kind of shut your eyes to other possibilities as you look around. But on the other hand, if you say, how could we get more users to use this site? That's a wide open question. There's a million things you could do. If you say buy about this much in about this much time, we're talking about very small experiments. We're talking about what are some ideas we could try right now and see if they're going in the right directions. It's a good 
way to put a constraint on what you're talking about and a regular time to check in. But I go back and forth on it. Leaving things wide open and taking the time you need is also as valid. One story about deadlines I really liked um, was about the moon landings, which is probably the most arbitrary deadline of all. We choose to do these things not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Well, that's, that's a good reason. <laughs> um, lots, lots of things was of interest in this book. One thing is uh, they really used people up, which isn't a good aspect of deadlines. There's lots of people who didn't sleep for a long time and uh, really poured their lives into it, which we don't want to get. But one thing I did like was that absolute like commitment and focus and creativity. If we're going to do this, here's how we can here's how we can move in the right direction. There's so many problems to solve. We don't know what they all are yet, but if we do this and we do this and we all focus, that should be OK. Coupled with um, people in authority ceding to people closest to the work to make the right decisions. So for one for one launch, um, as readings were looking a wee bit weird, um, the president's waiting to hear if this launch manages to orbit the moon. If they don't do this, they're very much not on track to meet that all important end of the decade deadline. So it's, it's so much we want to land here. But if there's anything at all putting uh, people on the ship at risk, if, if, if this is going to set us back because something will go wrong, the uh, operator, the fairly sort of junior person operating the machines and looking at the numbers, um, should be in the best position to judge whether it's safe to go on or not. So someone extremely senior telling them we don't have to go to the moon today in a caring support of don't you worry about the president or anyone else is the kind of message we want when you're trying to meet deadlines to make it so important that we focus on it and we do our best to get it, but be willing to drop it at a moment's notice if it turns out not to be the right thing to do. That's the balance we want to try and get. Overall, what have we learned? Um, OKRs, as you've seen today, is something I've thought about a lot. I've got a lot out of them because it's mostly a framework to focus on the things that should be important anyway, but it gives you regular time and space to, to aim for something and reflect on why that was so hard or why you know so little about it. It's good for that, but I still hesitate on whether to recommend them to people because again and again, uh, people, including me, get tied up in knots with what's the exact right number or how should I phrase this? That, that key result that we want to get, how do you do it? For some reason, we, we struggle as humans <laughs> to not turn it into a system you can game, a stick to beat people with, or uh, just that sort of New Year's resolution thing that you put lots of effort into and then don't really focus on at all. Um, there's something here. I like the idea of them and they can be used well. So I'd recommend sticking with them. And that is the end of my prepared remarks. Uh, I'll share lots of links from that today, but I think we've still got a good amount of time for any questions, if you'd like. Wow. Oh, and there's hands. Should I pick people? Uh, Emily. Sorry, just trying to get my microphone on. Um, yeah, hi. Yeah, I, I was I'm really excited because I don't fully understand OKRs. I still kind of don't understand OKRs. Um, but I have a Kanban team and uh, we're now, well, both of, both of my Kanban teams are now doing projects. One, I got a vision for that sounds like it was an OKR. OKR. We didn't fully hit it, but we did achieve a lot. We had a lot of things got in the way. Um, and I guess I'm, my question is, how do you, is, I have so many questions and it's hard to formulate, but, but how, one is, you know, how is a vision different than an OKR? And two, how do I incorporate these or should I incorporate these for these projects um, in a way that doesn't sound like, oh my gosh, Emily's now imposing another thing on us? You know, especially because my one team is really hates the whole concept of whip limits. <laughs> so. That's interesting. So um, these are one tool you can pick up and use. Uh, they're useful in some contexts and not in others. So it's not like uh, everyone should use OKRs. And if you're at a company where people are saying that, you probably have to go along with it, but they're wrong. Um, they are useful in lots of situations. Um, where I've, where I've worked with Kanban or Scrum and, and product visions and things. Uh, there's a good article, I'll find a link somewhere, from John Cutler about 
uh, things in cycles of one to three. So a typical task you pick up if they're broken down quite well, it's like one to three hour. And a, a sprint or your sort of Kanban replenishment cycle is often one to three weeks. And a vision when you might get to like the big picture thing, maybe that's one to three years. Like it's it's a good amount of time away. So that leaves a gap, that one to three months of what are we aiming for now? So in some bits of work, that could be phases, you know, like uh, alpha discovery and things like that. They're of that kind of size, like a few months. So maybe framing those OKRs is useful or not. I wouldn't maybe have both. Um, but often with teams, we're going to something, we're going to get there in a few years. How do you steer along the way at a resolution bigger than every couple of weeks is where OKRs can come into. So if your overall vision is whatever, it's marvellous, but it's years of work. In the next three months, if we move these things in that direction, so you describe what's going to be different in the world in three months, in a sentence or two, we're going to have uh, users knocking down our door to sign up for our thing because it's so great and we will know we're succeeding when you see this number of signups, this number of referrals being shared, this number of thing. And that lets you like prioritise every week. This is things we'll work on. This is things we want to learn or talk to users about because that, that should move these numbers. So that's a way it can fit in with other kinds of framework. If you've got projects, if they've got a defined plan and, and things you'll achieve by certain dates, I don't see a place for OKRs in that. Like, do you want people to try and meet numbers and, and creatively come up with ways to do them? If you do, it's not really a project. Maybe that's a time box or something like that. And, and maybe OKRs fit quite well there. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. And and if you've got any, say, any links or more information to to read up about OKRs, would be really helpful. <laughs> I'm hoping this helps yeah, us. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, glossed over maybe a little bit to focus more on how we used OKRs rather than a bit about where they come from. So I'll put a link in the chat now to more things than you could ever read. <laughs> well, about why, so <laughs> where OKRs came from and why they're any good at all. Cool. Um, who's got another question? Let's see. Uh, Darren. Thank you, Neil. Um, yeah, I think you've you've kind of covered. I got two questions. You covered a bit in my first one, which was around the um, how this is managed against things like sprint goals. So there's a little bit of duplication dependent on the, the, the cadence, but it's also different where you're talking about health checks and everything else. So I, I guess they, they can run side by side and they are quite different, but you can add both. Um, so that, that was my, my first point. And then the second one was, we're um, I'm leading a number of delivery teams on the same product, but they've all got slightly different focuses. Would you say that having one, OKR session is better or would you split them up into the individual teams? So when you're thinking about dependencies and the best way of um, of having value, I suppose it's it's the level to pitch it at and, and how much time as well would be interesting, the time box to put into this because it could, could be quite consuming, you know, if it's on top of planning and everything else, or is it more, is it more a short, sharp check-in? It's similar to uh, like a daily stand-up scrum. Um, I quite like a book called, uh, like I just to read, called Angelica Sprocket's Pockets, <laughs> where she had pockets for everything. And that's how I feel what a lot of people get into with OKRs. We've got OKRs for teams and for individual products and for our department and stuff. So it can feel like if an OKR is a good thing, more of them better, right? And that's definitely a, a anti-pattern and a route loads of people go down. So where you can see these solving a problem, that's good, use them. And if you're not that sure, stay away because fewer, fewer is better. Um, there's a good podcast uh, at the BBC now, they're using them at quite a big scale, but for that whole department of about 3000 people, I think there's like three OKRs total. And then these are tracked at sort of across a, a mega website with loads of teams level. And um, it's Storm Fagan, brilliant name. Uh, who'd used them at a previous company and said it ended up with like every time somebody mentioned OKRs, they all felt sick. <laughs> like I just I hear about nothing else. Um, so here there's OKRs, there's big, big as a mega product. Here are some numbers we want to be moving and your team should be able to talk about how you're contributing to that. How are you moving that? And if that can be done for you with sprint goals, do it. If it can be done with like, we've got a plan for the year, a kind of roadmap with dates, if that works for you, do it. Or if you think your own OKR would help you frame that and feed into that, do that. But don't assume that you need OKRs for everything. 
Um, so that gives people a chance to, to really look into what are they good for, how can I tweak them, does it work for me and drop it if it doesn't. I think that freedom is really helpful. Um, and the fewer, because it's about um, that radical focus. And if you're radically focusing on a thousand things, you've, you've not gained in at all. You just wasted a lot of time. Yeah, that's that's helpful, Neil. So we've got we've got roadmaps at kind of program level because there's dependencies between teams and they have individual sprint goals. But I think the probably the value from what you've said on the OKRs is when speaking to the, the delivery managers at the start of the week, it gives them a bit of a focus. What's the key thing you're you're looking at? And also it's a nice little check in at the end. because I suppose it's a celebration as in, look, we, we've done it. It's a bit of a pat on the back or um, I've been distracted because of something else. It's, it, it's that balance between giving a little bit of structure and direction and not overburdening with more meetings yeah. and processes. Yeah, Absolutely. but really useful things. The other thing that's really good for OKRs is um, if the OKRs talk about the metrics you'd want to change, like why does this matter? So it's more money for our business or more time saved or whatever you do. And what's good for our users about it? You say we'd like to see these numbers, which will mean we know good things are happening. That can be totally separate from somebody says, and we believe this is the plan to get there. Here's exactly what we're going to do. Or, and we're going to work out as we go. We're going to try this thing and, and do different things. So that's separating meanings or measuring your outcome from what the things you do. And that's quite nice to, to, if it's not a big overhead, to have a sense of later, we did all that stuff and I feel satisfied that there's a pile of Jira tickets in the done column, but does it matter? So seeing these numbers change or, or talking about, what these numbers are and, and, and how you can measure them is a, a good exercise and habit to get more of us into. That's, that's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, keeps keeps the team honest and actually it's a good conversation piece then because if you think that the focus should be one thing and then they say, no, my, you know, my key OKR for this week is something else. It's a discussion point, isn't it? To align those expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Louise, you got your hand up. Hello. Um... Have you ever used OKRs in, I guess, the earlier GDS phases of um, a lifecycle, say in Discovery or Alpha? Are they really more appropriate for when you get to beta? Um, I think it varies. So sometimes with a Discovery um, or an Alpha, you've got it pretty clearly. Uh, we want to define this problem better. We'll know we're done that when. And there's some good guides on doing that. Uh, I think Will Middleton's got some excellent uh, how do you frame a discovery, like bite off enough of the mess to do it. Um, and if that works for you, definitely stick with that rather than OKRs. Um, but it might be it might be appropriate for them. And similarly for Alpha, there might be a way you can measure. We'll know we're done in Alpha when we've seen these metrics kind of move. Um, and it can be good. They're of the right kind of size, so that kind of one to three months ish if you pick a date that you want to be done by is just a good habit because otherwise these things can can sprawl on for ages i think if you feel you're framing uh framing your sort of exit criteria from these phases well enough anyway you probably won't get much out of okrs they, they really yeah. come into their own when i think you get left on your own and the last one's live <laughs> when you yeah. have like a good few weeks or months defined for you suddenly mm -hmm. and this might be the rest of your life <laughs> um and i had a second question as well so to, to sort of get started with this for a team to just sort of get started with this in say somewhere the size of dwp would you recommend they they just do something as a team may be informed by strategic objectives that um you know even if they're not okrs i'm just trying to think like or does it sort of need that wider um implementation almost uh you know, no what, what would you that's recommend? a really good question yeah a really good question lots of lots of places i think think you can't really get started <laughs> unless it comes from the top and they define it well um one interesting thing google found uh that i really relate to is you would think um you you'd be able to say as a business we want these few things described as okrs therefore these departments should do these things therefore each team should do this and have them lathered up neatly and there's diagrams of that it is so much more difficult than you'd expect and gives you so much less value than you'd think yeah so google said they, they wasted like months on that and what do you get at the end so you if everyone says these are my okrs this is the overall okrs and these are mine you can just see like that sounds like it should vaguely relate to that i couldn't point to it really concretely about a cascade but that's 
yeah, sounds like it would do that. I see why you're doing that. And there's one team pointing that direction. You're like, can we talk? <laughs> like, what's that got to do with this? Yeah. Is enough. And I think that works really well. Lots of places have good visions, like our mission that's that's quite cloudy and, and hard to say. So concretely, where do you expect to be in three months or whatnot? It's more here's our principles or or, or a big floaty thing. But that's that's worked really well for me. So I know in the big org I work for, these things are important. Therefore, um, an OKR that, that wanted to achieve this, yeah. if that's the way we yeah. plan our team's work, don't have to wait for anybody else. And yeah. it's it's a good practice because you can report yeah. more on rather than I've met some deadline or I've achieved this many mm -hmm. story points. Mm -hmm. yeah. We thought these measures were good. Actual value. Those do sound yeah. like good measures. <laughs> yeah. Here's how we got on with them, so we can uh, drag other folk into good habits. <laughs> cool, thank you. Problem. I don't see any more hands. Oh, oh, one more. Yeah. Just when you thought you got away. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. I, I think it was really good. It's improved my knowledge from zero to probably about five in terms of understanding OKRs. So I really appreciate that. The second thing is, what's the worst thing that's happened in terms of your journey, Neil, in terms of implementing OKRs? And how did you rectify that? not just in your own or reconcile it, not just on your own or in your own mind and own experience, but almost admit to it and, and work it through your bit of the organisation or team and project. Ah. Um, one, one thing I've seen, I've worked at or with quite a few different companies, um, OKR, whack-a-mole, that idea that if OKRs are good, more of them must be better. And before you know it, each community of practice <laughs> has a few. Each individual has some, but like they're getting judged on by the line manager, as well as the team having multiple ones. Like if a whole 3,000 people can get three, and they grow up. And the more I, I talk through this, or I talk through reasons, or I show you evidence, or I just talk about how do you feel, like tell me, Tell me one person, one key result from this team of like 15 people. There are 100 radical focuses. Tell me one person's key result and where it's up to. You don't know. <laughs> but that, try to drag people back to it and, and have fewer. Um, where, where people are addicted to it, there's just more and more. It's a constant thing I struggle with. And it's, some companies are really happy to, to slimline and, and be sure you're still doing loads of work, but, but keep it simple, where others really love just having more, more and more. It mm. feels good. Um, the other thing, uh, where have I gone wrong? We started going down the wrong path where we realised how powerful the, the sort of tech debt, the, the clear up all that old stuff one was. It was amazing. It was like burning a blowtorch on stuff that hadn't shifted for years. But that led us down a path of we'll have one technical OKR and one people focus on it and one for that thing. And before you know it, I'm like, this is all the stuff we were always going to do anyway, except now we've just had a load of extra meetings and called them confusing stuff. So that did take me a little while to stop and say, do you know what we're hoping to get out of these? And do you know what I'm worried about? And I did manage to turn the ship around and calm things down there. OK. Brilliant. Thank you. And there's one more hand. Sorry, Neil, it's just me. Um, just asking. Um, you did mention, you know, you in your response to 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 one of us that um uh there is a someone's written something about OKR discovery, how to get started with that. I think um yeah, that would be relevant to me, but I I missed the name that you mentioned. Let me look. So um well Middleton. Let me see discovery. Um, this isn't OKRs, but this is about um, some good advice for how do you, there it is. That's yeah. it exactly, thank you. Uh, what, that, what's the first name? Yeah, so uh, what's the well, first? Well, so that the links just appeared in the chat, if you can see that. Ah, thank um, you. So that's a really good description of how will you know when you're done? What, what? How do you frame a discovery and how, and how you do it? I think if you do that, I don't know what OKRs would give you. So if you look at that and it's all you need, don't use OKRs for your discovery, I'd say. Thank you. Cheers. 
Cool. And that might be it. I think we're done. That was absolutely fabulous. Thank you, Neil. A lot of engagement. Really useful because it's an area people often, well, the, as you can see, people don't know. So if you want to take, put your camera off or your microphone off, a big round of applause for Neil. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thank you for coming. That was that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time. I know people leave. I'll just mention next time we have Emily Bark on technical coaching. We often talk about different types of coaching, business coaching, personal coaching, agile coaching. She'll be talking about coaching technical people, which is something that a lot of us do, but we don't always know how. And then uh, after that, month later, systems thinking and the seven-eyed model with John Tony Richards and followed by punishment driven development which is curious louise Elion. so thanks thanks neil thank you everyone for coming along that's been fabulous we'll see you all next time and it'll be on youtube for anyone who needs to catch up thank you thank you very much thank you bye, bye. bye.